Morning, Chair. Let me know when you're ready. I can do housekeeping. <clears throat> Good morning. I think my audio is off, but uh, Jason or, or Wayne, whoever wants to do our, our read in, go ahead. Jason will go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, and thank you for participating in our remote meeting for Stationary Source Committee. We have two formats for participation, the Zoom web application as well as teleconference. Please silence your other communication devices, such as your cell or desk phone, so that there aren't any disruptions throughout the meeting. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom, except for board members and South Coast AQMD staff, will be placed on mute by the host. That means you will not be able to mute or unmute your lines manually. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comment. For those on Zoom, if you would like to make public comment on the Zoom screen, please click the raise hand button. If you are using Zoom on your smartphone, please tap the raise hand button on the bottom of the screen. For those calling in using the phone line only, you can dial star nine on your keypad to signal that you would like to comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Speakers may be limited to a total of three minutes or less for the entirety of the consent calendar and agenda items. A countdown timer will be displayed on the screen for each public comment. If interpretation is needed, more time will be allotted. Please note you can hang up or leave the Zoom meeting at any time. Please adhere to the speaker time limit and treat others with courtesy, civility, and respect. Failure to do so can result in your mic being muted or you being dropped from the meeting. That concludes the housekeeping remarks. Chair, the meeting is yours. Very good. I'll go ahead and call the uh, Station Resource Committee meeting to order. We can do a roll call, please. Claire Delgado. Absent. <clears throat> Vice Chair Kuehl. Here. Board Member Padilla Campos. Absent. Vice Mayor Richardson. Absent. Supervisor Rutherford. Absent. And Chair Benoit. I'm here. We do have a quorum, correct? We do not have a quorum. Not, okay. Supervisor Rutherford just joined. So I believe we do have a quorum now. Yeah, thank you. Very good. All right, with that, we'll go into our first item. Uh, item number one, the proposed rule uh, 461.1, gas and transfer and dispensing. Susan Nakamura, go ahead. Morning, so next slide. So um, I'm gonna be presenting today on a, a new proposed rule we're working on called Proposed Rule 461.1, uh, which addresses uh, gasoline dispensing from mobile fuelers. Uh, we have an existing rule 461 uh, that does address gasoline dis transfer and dispensing uh, for stationary gas stations, which we refer to as stationary gasoline dispensing facili facilities or GDFs, and also does cover mobile gasoline dispensing. Um, the concern from an air quality perspective uh, for gasoline transfer is, for, is that uh, gasoline vapors, gasoline has a high vapor pressure. Uh, so the vapors uh, do, uh, the emissions do volatilize. Uh, concerns for VOC, which is an ozone precursor and also benzene, which is a uh, toxic air contaminant as, and is a carcinogen. So um, we did brief the stationary source committee uh, probably about a, a year ago, maybe longer in regards to sort of the emerging um, uh, mobile fuel, retail mobile fueling. And uh, the decision was that we needed to develop a, a rule, proposed rule 461.1, uh, that will move all the provisions for retail and non-retail mobile fueling into this new proposed rule. Uh, so we have worked through a uh, public process, uh, working, had he held eight working group meetings. Uh, we're planning another working group meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then we have, uh, we held a public workshop. Next slide, please. So I'm on slide three and I just wanted to give a little bit of background on 461. So 461, which is the current rule, uh, currently requires that any, and just focusing on the, the requirements for mobile fuelers, 
but does require mobile fuelers with tanks that are greater than 120 gallons uh, to be uh, have certain equipment. And the two uh, pieces of equipment are designed to reduce or minimize the amount of vapors uh, during the transfer of fuel into uh, the mobile fueler and then the transfer of fuel uh, from the mobile fueler into the motor vehicle or uh, the other tank. Um, so um, these vapor recovery systems uh, for um, uh, the transfer of fuel is referred to as phase one. Uh, for the dispensing of fuel is referred to as phase two vapor recovery. Next slide. Uh, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of um, uh, background information uh, in regards to the emissions and uh, just qualitatively to illustrate the difference between uh, stationary gasoline dispensing and the comparison to mobile fueling. So stationary gasoline dispensing facilities are required to have phase one vapor recovery systems. That's the transfer of fuel into uh, the storage tank and then phase two vapor recovery systems. And that's uh, for the dispensing nozzle is that boot that uh, folks see as they're dispensing fuel into their own motor vehicle. And so in comparison, we see three general categories of uh, mobile fuelers uh, that generally, uh, as we're talking about retail mobile fuelers, but also for non-retail. Uh, so the first type of mobile fueler is one that is equipped with CARB certified phase one and CARB certified phase two vapor recovery systems. And so uh, the emissions from those would be very similar to stationary gasoline dispensing facilities. Uh, the second uh, category would be uh, for a mobile fueler that has a phase one vapor recovery system and then what is referred to as a non-vapor recovery uh, but does not have phase two. And so those uh, types of mobile fuelers uh, would be limited to fueling only vehicles with onboard uh, vapor recovery systems. Um, and then the third category is uh, the type of mobile fueler that would not have phase one or phase two. Um, and the emissions from these two categories would be substantially higher than if you were to compare it to a stationary gasoline dispensing facility. On the loading side could be as high as 50 times higher, on the dispensing side, 20 times higher. Next slide, please. So I um, wanted to highlight sort of the status of uh, CARB certification of the phase one and phase two vapor recovery system. So uh, the California Air Resources Board, they do uh, perform these certifications for stationary facilities and for mobile fuelers to ensure that uh, they meet these specific requirements for phase one and phase two. So um, there uh, has been a certification for what's referred to as the HillVac mobile fueler, uh, which does have phase one and phase two vapor recovery systems. Uh, but in 2019, there was a component that was part of the phase two vapor recovery system that was no longer being manufactured. And so as a result, um, CARB uh, is working with this company, HillVac, to recertify, and the company uh, has a replacement component. But that system is currently uh, not available for any new mobile fuelers. Uh, there is a second mobile fueler that has been recently certified by CARB, uh, and it's been certified and it has phase one vapor recovery, but, but does not have the phase two vapor recovery system. Um, so this, this one um, is limited to fueling only vehicles with onboard uh, vapor recovery or, or VR, um, which uh, does take those vapors, uh, but it doesn't uh, have this, the second component of the phase two vapor recovery. And then just something to note is that this particular uh, certification is limited to uh, booster fuels and um, it's um, so boost only booster fuels could use this particular uh, certification. Next slide. So the need for uh, 461.1 is that uh, because there uh, isn't a phase one, phase two vapor recovery system that's available right now, um, uh, any mobile fueler that uh, any new retail mobile fueler that comes in can't meet the requirements of 461. Um, and then uh, we are concerned because retail mobile fuelers with tanks that are less than 120 gallons that they're uncontrolled uh, and they're currently unregulated. Uh, and then any retail mobile fueler that may even be a, above 120 gallons if they don't have the vapor recovery systems uh, is a concern to us. 
Uh, so the proposed rulemaking will address the regulatory gaps, align uh, the requirements for all mobile fuelers, and really uh, ensure by establishing requirements to minimize the VOC and benzene emissions. Next slide. So the key requirements for 461.1 uh, is the, the rule uh, would apply to retail and non-retail mobile fuelers that are dispensing gasoline. Uh, we want to take the applicability for retail mobile fuelers down to those with uh, cumulative capacity greater than, greater than 10 gallons. Uh, we are concerned that if we don't go to this lower threshold that uh, there could be the possibility for someone that's conducting a retail operation that uh, they uh, could try to um, uh, have a, a, a business uh, that would be based on non-controlled equipment. So it, we felt it was important to have this lower threshold. Uh, the 120 gallons is consistent with the current 461 rule for non-retail. Uh, so there's very minimal uh, impacts on the non-retail side of, of mobile fueling. Um, there will, uh, we are including requirements for the dispensing locations. Uh, that's for the uh, where the fuel is going to be dispensed in a parking lot or uh, at a business. And uh, there's certain requirements. Uh, one of the requirements that we have is that if there is the dispensing location is within a thousand feet of a school, uh, that uh, there's a prohibition of not dispensing during the uh, school hours. Um, and then there's additional requirements in regards to the certification and uh, other requirements for record keeping, testing and maintenance. Next slide. Uh, so just wanted to highlight, uh, this is really the, the heart of the rule in terms of the uh, requirement for the CARB certified vapor recovery systems. Uh, so um, there is a, a state requirement that uh, we can't require any more stringent uh, type of uh, control unless there's at least two uh, CARB certified systems. Uh, so on the phase one vapor recovery, there's more than two systems that are available. So uh, the proposed rule would require that any uh, mobile fueler that is dispensing fuel and transferring fuel that the transfer of fuel into their mobile fueler tank uh, would have to be equipped with phase one vapor recovery. And then we're, we have an interim provision because there aren't two uh, certified phase two vapor recovery systems for mobile fuelers at this time. Uh, so this interim requirement uh, would allow the non-vapor recovery systems uh, and they would have to comply with the executive order, which would limit them to fueling only vehicles with ORVR uh, when they're dispensing gasoline. Next slide. So uh, once there are two certified phase two uh, vapor recovery systems uh, that are commercially available, uh, then we are proposing that um, that the uh, that the mobile fueling companies would need to then shift over to uh, phase two vapor recovery. Uh, we are working on the details of that. We're also working on the details and uh, the provisions for uh, the how we would define commercially available and the requirements of when the uh, certified phase two vapor recovery uh, systems become available and the requirement. Next slide. So this is just summarizing some of the uh, other provisions. So the requirements for 461, uh, really what we're doing is just removing any of the provisions that related to mobile fuelers or moving those out. Some minor clarification uh, provisions in there. Uh, 219 is our rule uh, that is, it, it's, uh, a little bit oddly written is that it's like what is exempt from permitting, but um, what it's going to require is that any mobile fuel retail mobile fueler that's dispensing or that has a tank greater than 10 gallons will be required to have a permit and then for non retail would be uh, greater than 120 gallons. And then um, we have our filing program for registration of the dispensing location. We're actually going back to look at uh, the provisions for uh, the registration and, and may have some changes uh, for that for the dispensing locations. Next slide. So um, this is just a summary, uh, but so uh, for the permitting, we're uh, looking at any mobile fueler that's greater than 10 gallons, uh, really no changes on the non vapor I mean, for the non-retail uh, mobile fuelers, uh, they'll still be required to submit a permit if they're over, if they have a capacity over 120 gallons. Next slide. So just wanted to highlight uh, one uh, key issue. Uh, we are still working on the rule and working with stakeholders, uh, but um, we felt that this was an issue that was important to raise. Um, so one of the um, stakeholders has expressed concerns in regards to 
uh, requiring the dispensing locations, the owner or operator of a dispensing location to file a registration. Um, and they, they're they concerned that that could be an impediment to their business because um, it's like one more uh, uh, item that the they would have to work with uh, on the dispensing location. And so um, we, we do feel like there has to be some mechanism that we build into the rule to know the dispensing locations. Uh, there's a couple uh, reasons for that. One being that we want the owner or operator to be aware uh, that gasoline is being dispensed on their property. And also there's the provision that we want to do uh, that check if there is a school within a thousand feet. We have that provision that not to um, fuel drain dispense fuel uh, during school hours. Uh, the other uh, part of this is that the um, fuel throughput that a mobile fueler is dispensing is um, there's a monthly throughput limit, which is back calculated based on the health risk because uh, benzene is a carcinogen. And so we want to really be careful that there's only one mobile fueling company because the other mobile fueling company won't know how much uh, each other has dispensed. And so we, it, it, we feel that it's important for public health and safety that we really limit it to one so we can monitor and ensure that we're not exceeding uh, the health risk uh, at that specific location. Next slide. So just to wrap up, uh, we're working towards uh, uh, the 30-day package right now. Uh, public hearing is scheduled for January 7th and uh, that concludes my presentation. So Susan, uh, can you go back to slide, I think it's 11 or 10, that talks about the gallons of the, of the vehicles. I, I, I didn't quite understand. I think you might've said that, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they can still dispense up to 120 or have a, a, a truck that can carry 120 gallons. Of, back one more, uh, uh, back to 11, sorry. Or, or is this actually gonna capture then everybody, anyone that's out dispensing right now in that 120 gallon range tank, or we're gonna, we're gonna no longer be able to, they're not, they're not gonna be able to do that without a permit. Is that what you're saying? So uh, so are you talking about the uh, the second bar or yeah. the, okay. So the, the second bar is the current requirements right now. So currently permits are required for anyone dispensing 100 uh, or anyone with a tank uh, greater than 120 gallons or cumulative capacity of 250 gallons. So uh, that is the current requirement right now in, in regards to permitting, the okay. dark blue. But you wanna bring it down to 10 gallons. We wanna bring it down to 10 gallons for the retail mobile fuelers. For the non-retail, they'll still stay at the 120 gallon mark. Gotcha. I, well, I just wanna just real quickly say, I, I, I fully support that because I, I personally have run into a lot of these smaller trucks that are carrying that 120 gallon. And, and, and if anyone on the board hasn't seen one of those, what it is is they have three or four different tanks. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, just walking by these trucks in the parking lot, you can smell the vapor coming off of them just when they're not even dispensing. So I am fully supportive of, of that part of the rule of getting uh, really some constraints on these smaller trucks that are right now, in my opinion, skirting, the, skirting all the rules. And, and getting away with the ability to have a, a truck that as you walk by it, you can smell the gasoline coming off of it. So thank you for that. Um, I know we still have some other questions on the other, the other parts of this permit, but I, I just want to make sure that we get that part done for sure. That's a very important thing to, you know, we, it, to me, what I've seen from this uh, activity, um, there seems to be some good actors and there seems to be some that just want to skirt every rule out there. And I think this tightens that up. So thank you for that. Um, I do have some questions from other board members. Uh, uh, Supervisor Kuehl, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm uh, also concerned about clarifying, you know, who needs permits of what kind. But my question was a little smaller, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it really went to the limitations on uh, one mobile fuel company being able to serve within a particular area. I uh, talked to the staff yesterday about clarifying that that's not like a whole big region. They were talking about not having two servers like in one parking lot. And I wanted to make sure that that was clarified. So if I could ask if there's language uh, that kind of clarifies that. 
Yeah, so so uh, the rule uh, will have specific, it does have specific language in regards to the dispensing location and the definition of a dispensing location, but generally we're really referring to a specific a business parking lot, a, um, a specific area uh, that they're conducting the dispensing. So it could be at a, a business, it could be a parking lot, um, but not a general uh you know large area okay uh that was my question thank you mr chairman supervisor rutherford thank you chair i wanted to talk a bit more about the registration of the sites uh, that are visited and i certainly understand staff's concern that we need to know where those are and that we want to make sure the property owners are aware i would suggest that business people generally know when they're doing business with someone else. So we're sort of inserting ourselves in that process, but it's fair enough if you wanna have a record of, of where the mobile fuelers are uh, doing business. But I would suggest that we flip it and the burden really should be on the permittee, on the mobile fueler rather than on the recipient of the service. Uh, so if we could figure out how we require a list of the locations from the mobile fuelers or um, if they have to provide the signature of the on-site manager annually, but it, we really can't ask a third party to abide by rules that we set. Uh, they, they mostly won't do it, and then that damages this companies, the, this batch of companies that we're permitting. So let's find another way to get to that purpose. Yeah, so I definitely hear you uh, on that, and that was one of the key issues that we teed up. Uh, we are uh, actually rethinking uh, the provisions uh, for uh, for that reason and, and other reasons in regards to the registration, but where we think we can get to the same uh, need and information uh, that might be uh, more palatable for everybody. And when do you expect to have that thought through? So we're, we're working on it right now. The 30 day is I think December 7th or 8th. Uh, we're going to have a working group meeting before that to try to uh, bring everybody together to discuss the concept, but we're still working on it internally. Terrific, thank you, Susan. Remember Padilla Compost, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Susan, I just have a really basic question, just trying to understand the industry a little bit. Who do these um, mobile fueling um, companies service? So they, they uh, can service uh, fleets uh, of vehicles, but they can also uh, service uh, the general public. So uh, they could uh, be at uh, certain events and uh, stadiums and, and things like that, but they can also be sort of at fixed locations on certain campuses, uh, business campuses. Uh, things like that. So it really uh, varies. Uh, they have these, they're, they're kind of referred to as app based and somebody can uh, go on their phone and say they need to be filled and they need to go to that specific designated dispensing location to, to get filled. You know, one other one I'll add on that is uh, some fire departments really rely on these. It's, you know, where, the, where they're going to the firehouses so that the firemen don't have to be off site to go get their fuel. Um, I, I've seen them personally at Angel Stadium. I know they operate at Dodger Stadium as well. So yeah, and you'll see the ads in the in, while you're in the stadium that they're offering to fill up your car. I keep getting the urge to send them to my Tesla, but I, I just don't think they'll figure it out. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so I, I get that there's some needs for this out there. Um, I, I will say though that it, uh, it just. I, everything we can do to make sure that the people are complying as much as possible, because I, you know, I feel very strongly that I hear from so many of our gas station operators on a regular basis, the amount of rules that are on those gas stations and, and the, the vapor to recovery, the, the proper nozzles. And it just drives me nuts when I walk by a truck that's got three tanks, including one diesel tank, and none of them have any vapor recovery at all on any of the handles. And so to, to tighten this up to where we're controlling at least those operators is very important to me. But, but to also recognize there are some great operators out there that are putting as much of the equipment on as they can. They're building into their app where the, the, the dispenser knows, hey, this is a 1972 car. It doesn't have vapor recovery. I can't dispense to you. Sorry. 
So I think that there are good operators in this field and there are bad and, and everything where it looks like on this, we're getting really close to finally buttoning that up. So thank you. Supervisor Rutherford, your hand's still up. You have another question? I just thought one other uh, customer for this service that I learned about in, in the research on this was the disabled community. Yes. That mobile fuelers often have pop-up events where folks with limited mobility can just drive through and not have to get out of their car and it's a real benefit to them. Yep. Yep, and someone like my sister uh, would definitely use that. So yeah, there's there's definitely the needs there. We get it, but boy, I just want to make sure we're only allowing the good operators in our in our area district, especially and the smaller operators that are skirting the law. It's got to stop. So thank you. Any other questions from the board members? If not, we'll go to public comment. Do we have any public comment on this item? I do see a hand raise, uh, Laura Moorhead, go ahead. Or Laurel, sorry. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Hi, my name is Laurel Moorhead and I represent Transfer Flow Incorporated and Transfer Flow manufactures um, mobile refueling tanks under 120 gallons. And so there's a couple things um, about this. First of all, um, CARB did a series of battery of tests on our refueling tanks between 2008 and 2012. They determined that our tanks do not create enough emissions for them to regulate them. So that's why our tanks aren't regulated by CARB. Um, but when you say on slide six that retail mobile fuelers with tanks 120 less are uncontrolled and currently unregulated, that's only by CARB. They are regulated for retail mobile fuelers. They're regulated by the fire marshal and OSHA and all mobile fuelers, whether they're retail or non-retail, are regulated by the Department of Transportation um, permits. And when you say that you see three tanks in the back of a vehicle, that's a violation of the Department of Transportation permit in itself. So people aren't supposed to be doing that. You can buy our tanks anywhere, like off Amazon on big box stores like Tractor Supply or Home Depot. But if somebody calls in and says that that's what they're doing, we're not allowed to sell them the tank for that. So um, another question I have is I'm unclear why this is being addressed by the stationary source committee instead of the mobile source committee. I understand that previously the rulemaking was for cargo tanks putting gas into gas stations. And so that's why it was a stationary source committee, but a mobile fueler putting gas into a vehicle should be in the mobile source committee because they're better able to understand what you do and don't have authority to um, permit. Um, and so um, that's basically what I'd like to say, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Joseph uh, Apaku. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the time. Uh, first of all, I do want to start off by uh, extending our gratitude to staff for uh, all the work that they're doing on this rule. Um, and we appreciate the fact that <clears throat> staff has been open to a lot of the comments that we as one of the stakeholders have made regarding uh, this rule, and we think we've made a lot of progress with it. Um, I do want to touch on two things very briefly. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, I do want to note that uh, we uh, do disagree with the uh, characterization of the uh, environmental impact of the booster. I'm sorry, I should mention that I represent booster. Um, and as was noted by staff, uh, we did recently receive uh, executive order from CARB. And we, want, we do think it's important to note that our model um, you know, is certified based on the use of two systems as well, the same phase one system and our system, which ensures that uh, we are only fueling vehicles that are equipped with ORVR, which has been deemed to be equivalent to phase two. So we disagree with the claim that uh, emissions are higher for our system uh, because we are held to 100% ORVR, and that was the finding that CARB made. Uh, but regardless of that, we are still very pleased with the progress that has been made on this uh, rulemaking. And our one issue has already been discussed, and I appreciate the discussion to it uh, to, so far. And that is uh, putting the requirement on the customer, the site operator or owner for permitting or registering. And I will echo some of the comments that were already made. We do think that this is going to be an unnecessary burden on uh, industry customers without any corresponding environmental benefit. And in fact, we think that there's a significant chance that imposing this requirement might actually 
uh, lead to a detriment to the environment in the sense that, as uh, Chair Benoit already mentioned, there are uh, unregulated operators out there that are operating in contravention of fire rules and um, our very clear experience has been that they will approach customers by telling them, you know, you don't need to work with this company that's waiting for permits. You can just work with us and we'll launch right away. And so given the way that they've operated under the fire uh, permitting restrictions, we would expect that the same would happen under this rule because a customer who's unfamiliar and reluctant to deal with a regulatory agency like AQMD will likely turn to the company that says you don't have to. Um, and with respect to the environmental benefit, we agree that it's appropriate to make sure that the owner or operator um, has approved our operations there, but we think that there are many ways that, that can be done without putting that burden on the client itself. And with respect to the environmental concerns, with, the, with all the other requirements that are currently in the proposed rule, um, we don't think that putting this burden on the customer, the owner operator of the location is going to have any impact on the uh, thousand feet from a school rule. There's gonna be plenty of information that will make that very Thank you. Uh, you ran out of time in your comments, sir, but we understand where you're going there with as far as the school rules. Thank you for that. Uh, Bill Lamar? Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Benoit, committee members. I'm Bill Lamar, Executive Director of the California Small Business Alliance. The Alliance has been a consistent member of the working group, which was formed to develop the suite of rules you, you see today. Our participation in the process was largely to represent our members, CFCA, the California Fuels and Convenience Alliance, formerly CIOMA, California Independent Oil Marketers Association, uh, which is a concerned stakeholder. CEFCA, uh, or CFCA, is the industry's statewide trade association, representing the needs of independent wholesale and retail marketers of gasoline, diesel, lubricating oils, and other petroleum products, transporters of those products, and retail convenience store operators. And the majority of their members are small business owners. In simple terms, CFCA members deliver transportation, fuel, and energy from their manufacturers to end use customers, such as wholesale or retail participants, who then deliver the fuel to individual users like service stations or to bulk purchasers like farmers, fleet fueling locations, government agencies, industrial complexes, and so on. CFCA members serve every region, city, county, and locality in California. We want to extend our appreciation to the staff and particularly to Susan Nakamura, Brittany Gallivan, and Karen Manwaring for their willingness and to engage with a mix of stakeholders to produce the suite of rules that you see today. One of our main concerns about these proposed rules, especially 461.1, was that it might create a competitive imbalance between CFCA's stationary source, fuel providers, gas stations, and fuel transporters, and these new and emergency, new and emerging mobile fuel service delivery businesses, staff skill and sensitivity to our concerns during rule development process has produced a suite of rules that we believe we can support. Thank you for allowing me to come in. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker, Harvey Etter. Uh, hello, am I being heard? You are, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Harvey Eder. I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition. Um, I, I'd like to uh, you know, get detailed uh, information on what kind of emissions are uh, occur occurring now. I know specifically benzene was men mentioned in We've been concerned about this. Um, also, PM 2.5. These were where a lot of the body counts come from. So, um, like uh, uh, Director Cochiati worked with uh, 
these uh, line keeping devices, cleanup devices, and whatnot. Um, you know, start anyway. This is important, and also other other fuels than fossil fuels. All right, and uh, systems for assisting with that. And this also goes to batteries, and that should include, like Ranji's been bringing up, recycling batteries, also recycling heat pumps, which have chlorofluorocarbons and other, you know, greenhouse gases with high numbers. Um, so uh, this needs to be for batteries, also for hydrogen de delivery for fuel cells. Now, if we could offer this as part of the price and in insurance or something, we're working out different models. It, it, to to uh, you know, people saying, "Oh, I can't find places." It goes with infrastructure. It, it reduces costs. It reduces range anxiety and all of this stuff. Now, there's there's been different models done around the country. Israel did a lot with replacing batteries. Okay, there's there's a lot of different stuff that's out there, and it's got to be you know, we got to have some forethought on this, and it could actually be a a, a big positive towards some of the problems that they're saying that this stuff, the infrastructure is lacking and it's going to take, you know, several years and whatnot. So this should parallel that and it should be controlled by public power, et cetera. And 80% 80, 80 of power in the U.S. is industrial owned. There's big problems. Look what's happening with PG&E, Edison, you know, the fires, they're getting criminal charges for murders. They've been bankrupt several times. Anyway, this is part of the transition as well. And looking at the local co-ops and small businesses owned by the community and labor, we've we've been discussing this to some extent. Equity with with some of the the, uh, the unions, uh, like uh, anyway, with the electricians, etc. So this needs to be done and, and looked at now as part of the overview. There's there's potential for for non-fossil fuels to to really mitigate adverse impact of the fossil fuels. And, and to facilitate the, the transition with equity and justice, environmental justice, et cetera, that we all want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Cheryl Atkinson? Okay, can you hear me okay? We can, go ahead. I have a very minor point and it's regarding the exception that you've made for uh, fuel containers under five gallons, and my minor point is that five gallons is an arbitrary figure. If you're setting a standard, you should align it with a standard that's already in place. Portable fuel containers are certified to an ASDM standard, F852, up to a capacity of 20 liters, which is 6.84 gallons. And that's my point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other public speakers on this item? Oh, I see Cheryl's hand again. Did you? But, oh, there we are. Okay. So with that, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, you know, there's a couple of comments there, Susan. Uh, one about the six gallons. I believe we said 10 gallons was the number we're going down to, right? Yeah. So for the portable fuel containers, it's five, but we're... Uh, we'll work with uh, Ms. Atkinson in regards to uh, aligning that. Uh, we we don't see uh, an issue with that. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I also want to address the comment about the 120 gallons or less. Um, staff, I just sent you a, a photo. If we could share that on the screen. Um, it, it, with all due respect to the, the lady that was saying that their tanks are only supposed to be used for 120 gallons, um, what I've seen consistently from the use of those is what I, well, this photo we're going to put on the screen here momentarily, um, that is not is what, happen, what happens. They put multiple tanks in the back of a pickup, and this is what we've been seeing across the region. I've seen this actually in a couple different places. So. Um, uh, th this needs to be regulated. And if you look at the uh, the hose there, that's of course that's diesel, doesn't have the vapor recovery, but there's also was uh, unleaded in this truck as well. It also did not have any vapor recovery, of course. How could it? Uh, but it's it just, this is where, I'm sorry, I we, we've got to do something to close this gap because if, they, if the alternative of this is the booster fuel type trucks, um, which I'm sure will be other trucks like them, but where you do have far more equipment, far more regulatory structure and this is falling through the cracks in my opinion. So thank you for that, but uh, this, this can't continue, especially in our area district with all the other impacts we have going on. All right, any other comments or questions from the board members? 
Very good. We're going to go on to the next item. Proposed rule 1135, emissions of oxides from uh, electricity from the generation facilities, as well as proposed rule 429. Michael Morris, go ahead. Thank you and good morning. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as background for, for this rule, uh, rule 1135 and 429.2 will apply to uh, power plants. Uh, we have 32 facilities, uh, reclaim, non-reclaim, and former reclaim facilities that this rule will apply to. Uh, as you may remember, uh, we amended this rule back in 2018 to uh, expand the applicability to include, include all uh, power plants. Um, and to establish uh, NOx bark limits for these units. Uh, the proposed rule uh, that we're bringing forward now uh, will align the startup and shutdown provisions with US EPA's 2015 policy, as well as some other things that I'll be getting into in the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, one of the things that we'll be doing with this uh, uh, Amendment is to remove the ammonia limits. Those will be handled through the permitting process. Uh, we'll also be um, looking at making some changes regarding the engines uh, located on Catalina Island. And I'll talk in, in much more detail in the next few slides about that. Uh, we'll also be um, referencing the startup and shutdown provisions in proposed rule 429.2, which I'll discuss at the end of this presentation. And then we'll be making some changes to the continuous emission monitoring system uh, requirements, uh, basically referencing newly adopted rules 218.2 and 218.3, as well as allowing time for backup units to comply with these SEMS requirements. Next slide, please. So I'd like to draw your attention to the photo on, on uh, this slide uh, to give you some uh, uh, idea of some of the challenges that uh, are facing uh, the Catalina Island uh, power plant. Uh, this is operated by Southern California Edison. Uh, they're currently operating six diesel engines here on the island. Those uh, engines are located around the uh, white building at the top of this photo. Um, they're fueled by the blue storage tanks of diesel, um, it's sort of in the middle right-hand side of the picture. Uh, they also do have some microturbines that are located on the bottom right hand of the picture. Um, those are 1.5 megawatts worth of microturbines that we provided for them back in 2011. Uh, those are fueled by propane that are located in those white cylindrical shapes, sort of the middle top of the picture. Um, Two items to note about this particular facility that are very challenging for uh, uh, this area. Um, the first is that uh, they don't have the infrastructure that most um, uh, facilities that would have on, located on the mainland. Uh, there's no uh, direct fuel supply. There's no pipelines to the island that provide natural gas or any other type of fuel. So all the fuel has to be barged in um, and the other uh, challenge is that the, um, most of the island is operated by the Conservancy, which um, has uh, directed that the uh, um, non-developed portion of the island remain non-developed. And so there isn't any more uh, land available. What you see in this picture is the land available to uh, the facility and um, there isn't really a, uh, much of an opportunity to expand beyond uh, this configuration. With those uh, challenges in mind, uh, Southern California Edison has um, looked to see how they would comply with our rule limits in 1135, which are 45 parts per million uh, NOx, and uh, did a, a feasibility study with um, a consultant in conjunction with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and US EPA to see what are their options. Uh, we provided additional time for the facility uh, to go out to 2029 if needed to be able to adopt a zero or near zero technology. Uh, through this feasibility study, they looked at a large number of options. Um, they included uh, some of the options that uh, we were looking at, which included solar, and um, uh, uh, undersea cables, but they also looked at uh, wave technology, floating 
um, uh, power uh, sources for solar and, and a great deal of another of other technologies, um, including uh, some uh, non uh, some near zero technologies like uh, greater liquid propane reliance. Um, they didn't specifically look at hydrogen that was ruled out um, right away because of the large uh, space requirement for the hydrogen fuel storage and the fuel cells themselves. Um, th after looking at the, the feasibility study, uh, Edison decided that they will replace the six engines with six tier four final engines uh, starting in 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, with these engines, we need to make a few adjustments to our rules. None of these adjustments will impact the emission limits that are already in place. Uh, we will be revising the averaging time for uh, the, the engines to from 60 minutes to now be three hours. That will avoid them having to um, uh, stop uh, and shut down the engines to avoid non-compliance because of transitory spikes. Uh, by taking care of this, we'll actually uh, avoid having additional emissions because of the starting and stopping of those engines. Uh, and in addition to having lower emissions, uh, this will also uh, make their uh, grid reliability stronger since uh, they won't have to be starting and stopping quite so frequently. Um, we've also revised the uh, extension criteria for these engines. Um, uh, previously, we had said that they would have to uh, change out a certain number of engines during uh, in order to qualify for these extensions. And instead, what we'll be doing is establishing an emission cap, which will be the same as if they had replaced those engines, um, guaranteeing those emission reductions. Next slide, please. So it's been brought to our attention that uh, some of our stakeholders uh, believe that uh, the, we should reevaluate uh, what we've done for uh, this particular site um, and require a zero emission technology and have stated that they don't believe that the proposed amendments that we're wake, making here uh, reflect BART. And so I'd like to point out that um, we, you know, we did uh, back in 2018 uh, offer a near zero or zero emission technology off ramp that would go out to 2029. Um, the technology, the feasibility study, uh, Edison has concluded that uh, they won't be able to have something in place by 2029. And so they're going with our, uh, the other option that we determined was BART, which is to put in tier four final engines. Um, <clears throat> specifically, there's been some discussion about fuel cells. And in looking at the fuel cells, uh, they would need to replace uh, the six diesel generators with 21 fuel cells. Uh, these would require much greater um, uh, footprint on, on the facility. And uh, also uh, it would require much greater footprint for the storage of the hydrogen itself. Um, the six fuel cells alone, roughly equating the same uh, space as the current engines would not be sufficient to provide the electricity needs for the island. Um, and so uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, the island uh, and, and Edison are, are still required to meet the 2045 requirement to go to uh, zero emissions. And so uh, these uh, engines would serve as emergency backup power uh, once they do find a zero emission alternative. Next slide, please. So our, our rule, uh, proposed rule 429.2, that uh, provides exemptions for the concentration limits during startup and shutdown activities. Um, these are limited by uh, the duration of those uh, events, as well as how many times they can happen in terms of scheduled startups. Uh, we do require uh, best management practices, including uh, operation of the control equipment whenever the unit uh, reaches, uh, whenever the unit is stable and it reaches minimum temperature, even if that's shorter than the provided uh, 
duration for a startup and shutdown. Next slide, please. So with these changes to the rule, we don't expect any uh, emission reductions, nor are we foregoing any emission reductions, and nor did th these uh, uh, changes to the rule uh, have any costs for these facilities. Next slide, please. And we're planning to bring this before the board in January, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Very good. Board member comments or questions on this one? Nope. I, I did. I uh, just want to thank staff. I know we received a letter with quite a few concerns and comments on this particular item. Uh, and I believe that the next speaker up, Mark Abramowitz, is the one that one of the signers of that letter. So. I, I think a, a lot of those uh, issues were addressed, and uh, but I think we'll probably get a few more questions. But Mark Umbramowitz, uh, public comment, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to ensure that the district complies with state law requirements to adopt rules that reflect best available retrofit control technology. That is out with the diesel, in with the zero emission, commercially available fuel cells on Catalina Island ask staff to perform the proper analysis. I'm also gonna help you avoid misinterpreting the staff presentation as I did, because it can mislead to form conclusions that simply aren't true. Staff may tell you that even though they are proposing substantive weakening of emission limits for the diesel at Catalina today, they want to rely on an analysis that they did three years ago. Even though technology and costs may have significantly changed, and state law doesn't say that sometimes you have to adopt rules that reflect BAR. Staff wants you to weaken the rule and doesn't want to reevaluate the feasibility of using fuel cells. Did I say reevaluate? Actually, in the last BARC analysis, staff did not evaluate the possibility of using fuel cells on Catalina. But don't the slides say that NREL looked at zero emission technology for Edison? They do, but not fuel cells. So apparently Edison rejected a fuel cell option early on. You won't find this in the slides or the staff report. The slides say that fuel cells won't fit there, but that is not staff's analysis. They haven't done one. Staff can't tell you exactly what was looked at, I asked, in making the vague statements in the slides. What type of fuel cell, what sizes, what manufacturers? At least one manufacturer tells me that it is feasible. But frankly, the story on why it is infeasible keeps changing. At the public workshop, the reason that fuel cells wasn't work because there was no hydrogen on the island and diesel came over by barge. I confirmed that hydrogen could be brought over the same way and that the fuel cost could be even more competitive with diesel. Then when the slides came out, it was due to lack of space. Though solar wasn't rolled out for the same reason and was analyzed by NREL. Frankly, you shouldn't be sorting this out and doing a BARC analysis on the fly with no real data. Please direct your excellent staff to perform the required BARC analysis themselves. And instead of allowing continued use of diesel, let's replace toxic diesel with zero, zero emission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker, Laura Mormon. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, um, I didn't get a, a chance to respond to Ben Boyne's comment about my last comment. And so I'd like I'm to say sorry, that- I'm sorry, Laurel, this is, we've moved on to the next item. And if you, that was, that's not the, this isn't the time to go back to that. Uh, my, my apologies, but that's how these uh, meetings are set up where you have your time, we have our time. And then we're, we're, the, there'll be other times to comment on this as well as at our board meeting uh, when, and also the adoption of the rules. So if you want to comment at those times, you're free to do so. But uh, we've moved on to the next item. Uh, Harvey Etter. Uh, hello. hello, am I being heard? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Harvey Etter. Uh, I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition, etc. cetera. Um, thank you, Mr. Abramowitz, for, for joining the, the solar renewable bark team, your comments uh, last week uh, uh, re referenced uh, using new source review. Um, 
I'm incorporating by reference uh, the three meetings last Friday, all board meetings in the last several years, but specifically that meeting, uh, there was a discussion about the, the 2012 Supreme Court case, unanimous case, the board won technology forcing uh, about the coating manufacturers applies to solar. And we discussed this at the uh, February 8th meeting, Administrative Committee incorporated by reference as well, me, Dr. Burke, and a little by uh, Wayne. Okay, um, this is the law and it's not being obeyed. And I asked, I brought this up and asked the head of the Legislative Committee, Mr. Cosiati, uh, if he would, department, I had a friend, he said, department, he says, if this is state law, then you have to go to the Attorney General and enforce state law, okay? trying to say, okay, are you going to do this and enforce state law? And then Barbara chimes in legal and says, okay, well, we don't think that this applies to solar because there's some solar that is not cost effective. Well, first of all, they never studied it. We, we've been going 10, 20 years with, with uh, Baez and, and Bark for a long time. You know, this, this whole stuff is being purged. It was not up on, on these reviews, uh, you know, that, that EPA does for 10, 20 years. And uh, anyway, there's big problems, and we are litigating on this, and, and you all have to enforce state law. And even if there was, okay, where did you ever do any studies on this? It was not included in, in the SIP. I brought this up with Eon last week in a meeting, says not. I said, well, we'll work on it with, okay, but it's not done. It's not in there, and we are run out of court by this. This is really outrageous. And, and I think anybody who's got a law degree and does not sign by us or any kind of professional degree approved by the state should not have that degree and be practicing. This is really outrageous. The stuff is cost effective. It's here. We, we've incorporating everything from COP26 and it's cost effective. And, and the Sunshot program, 100 exhibits, nothing, nothing addressed. And when I brought this up, I said, you, you, and I used the term suckers. And I had the head of that committee, Kosiati, cut me up and say, you don't use an expletive. Well, that goes back to there's a sucker board and every attributive to, to uh, what's this, TV Barnum, and that's false. But there's the expression of fools born, born every minute that goes back to the Bible, I guess. Anyway, and that's, there is, and, and that's, it's foolish, more than foolish. It's, it's outrageously illegal. To, to not analyze solar and renewables and, and, and this stuff. And uh, we got to change. This is fossil fuels. It's on its way. Very good. Any more public comments on this item? All right. With that, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, comments and questions from the board members. I'll defer to my board so I don't jump ahead of everybody again like I did last time. Oh, someone's got their hand raised and I had the wrong panel up. Uh, go ahead, uh, board member Patio Campos, please go ahead. Thank you. I, I was just curious, following up Mr. Mark's comments about performing a uh, bark analysis for the fuel cell feasibility, is that something we can do? And um, what does staff think about that? So, so, um, we did perform a BART analysis in 2018, and we did review uh, the um, fuel cells uh, as this was brought to our attention um, and, and provided our analysis today. So board member, um, I wanna sit down with staff and, and look a little bit uh, more into this issue. So we'll hopefully get back to you on this, these issues a little, as soon as we can. Great, thank you. Thank you. And I'll also just say that, you know, I, I was encouraged when Edison first took this up and uh, was hoping they would find solutions that were zero. Uh, and, and Mark, I, I'm with you on that. Um, you know, they talk about the constraints for location for the, um, the, where they're at as far as the generation facility. There's, a, there's two different major landowners on the island. The one right around their generation facility doesn't seem to be willing to give up much of anything, but yet there's another a, a couple owners further back on the island where the solar can go. Um, but I do question too, could there, if there's room back there for that solar, could there be maybe hydrogen or solar back there? I, I'm not sure. Um, I do know that trying to get the hydrogen probably back off of the barge up that hill back to the other location where the solar would be would probably be very difficult. The roads are very narrow and small. And so I, I have gone out there and toured the facility and, and to get a better understanding of the constraints they have out there. 
Uh, but Wayne, I do also want us to take one last look at this before we continue down this path. Um, uh, you know, but also, you know, Mark, you brought up that the study's three years old. Um, you know, it seems like that was just the other day we got that study back. But uh, it has been three years, and if we could look at it one more time and just double check that things haven't changed or that there aren't still some other opportunities. But uh, regardless, I, I know that Edison's been working on this, and, and from the folks I talked to on the island, from Edison, from uh, also sitting down with their mayor at the time out there. They want to get away from this too. It's just the constraints they're under and the technology at the time wasn't quite there. But um, and then also the transmission on the island isn't great either. So that the, where the transmission lines go from one side of the island to the other, they're very limited in capacity. So there's just so many constraints on that island that you, it just sounds so easy. And, and anecdotally from a from afar, it seems like there shouldn't be a reason why we can't do this here. But I've asked over and over again to make sure if, we're, if there's any way to do it, we can. And, and, and I think at the end of the day, they get there and they know they have to get there, but they just can't quite do it right now. And that's why we did allow them to upgrade at least their current diesels to, uh, to a new tier four. And those are, that is actually happening. The first of those diesel engines have been replaced. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to try to take a look at that next month to see how that's going. But uh, the more we can move in that direction, I think we all want that. And I know Catalina does too. It's just a matter of timing, location, and, uh, Unfortunately, some some landowners that don't want to give up some some land for what we think would be a great opportunity. So, anything else I can do to help on that, Wayne? Too, please let me know. We'll do. Thank you. All right. Any other board member questions on that? If not, we'll go ahead and move on to the annual report on AB twenty five eighty eight. Ian, go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, today's item is a routine item uh, that we bring every year to uh, uh, to the board. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the AB 2588 uh, program annual report includes a number of uh, different pieces. It does primarily focus on AB 2588 uh, uh, staff activities to implement the Hotspots Act. This uh, is an older program now. It has been uh, going on for several decades. Uh, we do include a little bit of uh, extra information in here too about uh, other activities related to toxic air contaminants uh, and then some uh, uh, discussion about future activities uh, uh, as well as any updates to any AB 2588 guidance. Uh, we, we are required by statute to bring this to uh, the board every year through a public hearing. Uh, uh, this year it's coming, uh, of course, uh, 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 fairly late in the year. There's a number of other items that were uh, uh, just sort of uh, put in front of it as this was a routine item. We just pulled this one back a little bit. Next year, we anticipate bringing this a little bit earlier in the year. Next slide, please. Uh, AB 2588 can be a, a quite a complicated program. Uh, but just as a, at a basic level, it's really these five components. Uh, uh, data is collected uh, about the toxic emissions from facilities. Uh, uh, a lot of that information is also available on AQMD's FIND website. Uh, there's a series of screening processes and, and analyses that are conducted to determine uh, if uh, facilities uh, have a potential to impact uh, the public. Uh, we uh, uh, sometimes will require a full health risk assessment. Uh, if those uh, risks from that health risk assessment exceed AQMD thresholds, uh, the facility might need to do a public notification process. Uh, and ultimately, if risks are high enough, they would need to reduce their risks. Uh, this is really just one piece. It's, it's quite unique, uh, especially when you look around the nation, how uh, toxics are treated from permitted facilities. Uh, this is really a very unique program. Um, uh, so I'll just go through a little bit more detail uh, on the next slides. Next one, please. Uh, so diving into a little bit more of that detail, uh, the AB 2588 process really is a series of uh, almost escalating uh, levels of analysis and review uh, where uh, uh, there's a series of screening steps that are conducted to determine uh, uh, what level of review is needed, what level of analysis is needed. It starts with this initial quadrennial emissions inventory, inventory. so every four years. Uh, facilities uh, report a comprehensive uh, list of uh, toxic emissions from their facility and from their operations. Uh, there were 128 uh, quadrennial reports in 2020. They go through a screening process uh, following from that called prioritization. Uh, 77 facilities uh, uh, had their priority scores audited where there is a detailed staff review. Uh, from there, it goes on to a much more detailed air toxic inventory report. This can uh, can include site-specific uh, source test uh, uh, analyses as well. 
Uh, from the air toxics inventory report, we then would go to a health risk assessment. If it looks like uh, from that ATIR that uh, uh, AQMD thresholds could potentially be exceeded with an HRA, uh, uh, two facilities were required to uh, submit a, a health risk assessment. So we would see that we whittled down through this screening process uh, the, the amount of uh, health risk assessments that need to be conducted. These are very uh, 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 comprehensive reports uh, and can be uh, a bit complicated. Uh, from there, uh, we then go into the public notification and or risk reduction process. Uh, we did have a couple of facilities uh, have to go to that uh, risk reduction process. Next slide, please. So that's the AB 2588 process, which is a state program that we implement uh, as an air district, but uh, we implement this through our rule 1402. Uh, there are uh, some enhancements that we have added to this AB 2588 program to try to make it run a little bit smoother. Uh, so uh, the traditional approach is what I just walked through, uh, that facilities uh, that have a priority score greater than 10 and cancer risks less than uh, 100 in a million, uh, they go through that traditional process I just walked through. Uh, uh, in addition, we have some uh, a couple of other programs that the board adopted uh, a few years back. Uh, one of them is the Voluntary Risk Reduction Program, and this uh, provides facilities an opportunity to go above and beyond and to reduce risks that they wouldn't need to do under AB 2588. Uh, but the benefit for them of, of taking that extra step is to uh, have a modified public notification process uh, uh, not uh, quite as comprehensive as um, uh, uh, sort of the traditional approach, uh, and some facilities really find some benefit in this, uh, but this re does require additional risk reduction uh, that we wouldn't have happening otherwise. So we, we found that this uh, can be quite successful. Uh, in addition, uh, for those facilities that are potentially very high risk, or we call them potentially high risk level facilities, uh, we have a, a more expedited approach. The traditional approach is very sequential uh, and deliberative, and it can take uh, longer than any Anybody really wants it to take, uh, but this potentially high risk level process uh, expedites the process when we know those risks are high and requires early uh, risk reduction uh, uh, to really make sure that those facilities that are impacting communities the most uh, don't have to wait for that longer sequential process. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we look at all of these processes, this is just a little summary for 2020. Uh, we see that there was a, a number of reviews. Uh, uh, most of this really is captured in that traditional AB 2588 process uh, with uh, 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 some additional actions on that potentially high risk side, as well as the voluntary risk reduction side. Next slide. Uh, just a, a quick, quick touch on some of the other toxics activities uh, that uh, are uh, that we uh, conducted in 2020. So, of course, there was a rulemaking, uh, Rule 1407.1, Rule 1426. Uh, those were both uh, adopted by the board uh, in uh, uh, 2021. A lot of that rulemaking work was occurring in 2020, though. Uh, there is a special monitoring, of course, that uh, has been talked about a lot, uh, whether that's in Paramount, in the greater LA area, in the West Rancho Dominguez area. Uh, a lot of this focused on uh, uh, metals uh, toxics. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a dispersion modeling that uh, uh, staff needs to uh, conduct and review sometimes, uh, in particular for Rule 1420.2 for smaller lead uh, facilities. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, meant to be a sort of a what's coming up, but now that we're at the end of the year, this is uh, a little bit of a preview for when we bring the annual report uh, again in just a few months for 2021. Uh, so we are continuing, of course, the uh, uh, typical auditing process that we do. Uh, a few things that will be a little bit different. Uh, uh, the uh, CARB uh, is um, adopting new regulations uh, that would apply to AB 2588. Uh, they're called the EICG or the CTR, uh, uh, Emissions Inventory Criteria Guidelines and Criteria and Toxics Reporting uh, Regulations. And these will be new regulations that facilities need to adhere to when reporting their emissions uh, to, uh, to us. We're trying to make sure that that process is as streamlined as possible with our existing programs and that the two new CARB programs or modified CARB programs uh, will also work together in a streamlined fashion as possible. So there's a lot of work to happen there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there's um, additional guidance that will always come down uh, from the state on uh, certain kinds of categories. We're uh, going to be working with CARB as much as we can to uh, 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 work on that guidance and, and understand how to implement that. Next slide. Uh, so just the next steps, uh, we you know, I do plan to uh, present this annual report at the public hearing in December. Uh, uh, right now, this is really just a receive and file uh, kind of action. 
Um, and that concludes my presentation and available for any questions. Vice Chair apparently had to step away for a moment. Supervisor Rutherford, as the next senior member of the committee, would you like to go ahead? Sure, the, the one who's still here. Uh, okay, do we have any questions on this report? Do we have any um, I do, this is uh, Sheila Kewell, sorry. Go ahead, I Supervisor. Had, uh, told them. Thank you uh, very much. I noticed that uh, the riskiest operations still seem to be the ones that are using hexavalent chromium in their metal operations. And I know that we have uh, adopted some rules, uh, I think uh, this year, uh, you know, on spray booths, on welding, et cetera. But I wonder whether we feel confident that we're doing enough about hexavalent chromium, or if there may be more that we need to do to reduce this uh, apparently very high risk. Uh, that, that's a, I'll take a first stab at this. Uh, so that's a, a very um, astute observation that hex chrome has been uh, a concern for many facilities. Uh, I think there's been a lot of emerging science that's been coming out about hex chrome. I think our air district really has been leading the way as far as understanding these emissions uh, and understanding the potential impact on communities. Uh, I, I don't think that work is all uh, complete at this point. We've done a lot um, uh, to really uh, reduce the risk, both through the AB 2588 process, through understanding what's happening with our monitoring work through uh, different rulemakings. Um, but uh, I, I imagine that that will continue, certainly on the AB 2588 process. I'm not sure on the, on the rules side, uh, if maybe somebody else uh, uh, would be better. Uh, I see Susan popping up here. Yeah, so on, on the rule side, there's still more work for us to do uh, for hexavalent chrome. So um, we are assembling the 2022 rule forecast report uh, and some rules that you'll be seeing uh, that were on the TBD list in 2021 uh, will be uh, the, the rule for uh, metal heat treating for chromium alloys, uh, laser arc cutting. Um, we're looking at welding and torching uh, operations with uh, stainless steel and other chromium alloys. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the companion rule to 1469, uh, which is going to be called 1426.1, uh, which will look at high heat uh, uh, sodium dichromate tanks that are not at uh, facilities that are doing hexavalent chrome plating and anodizing. So uh, there's still a, a fair amount of work in regards to the metal processing, um, but th those are just kind of a highlight of uh, some upcoming rules. Uh, is there some way that we can align uh, the types of businesses about which we're uh, looking at uh, rulemaking in 2022 and the hotspots identified? Uh, I think there is. Um, uh just as a, a general identification, I think that's one thing we can look at. There is a, a, a cycle that facilities go through in 2588, a four year cycle that facilities do go through. Uh, I think that is something we could go back and, and look at to, to understand how those schedules might overlap. Uh, I don't think we have that in front of us right now, but I, I think I, I understand that's what your question is. Yeah, I mean, when I was in the legislature, we had a number of issues around hex chrome, uh, chrome six, et cetera. And uh, you know the the very the danger to people around it, which I know all of us in, uh, take very seriously uh, about cancer um, clusters and uh, cancer risk. Um, you know it's very real for the residents, and they can't do anything. They really count on us to do it. Um, I was um, somewhat stunned at the very good documentary that was presented just last week about the Santa Susana site, um, which was, as you know, one of the, the only uh, meltdown sites in the United States, denied for quite a long time and still not cleaned up. A lot of information about the cancer clusters, especially among children, specific kinds of cancer. And I just wanna make sure that 
we look at any alignment that's possible where there is a hotspot which is about cancer risk and the kinds of businesses in that or near that hotspot that we might want to prioritize uh, in terms of rulemaking. So um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And Supervisor, if I could add, I really appreciate the perspective that you uh, just uh, described. And we look at those issues, and I think as Susan was uh, describing, when we see an industry sector where there is uh, perhaps rules that have not yet been developed that address the current understanding, we move very quickly to develop those rules and to make sure that they're um, implemented uh, amongst that sector. And then we look at all the ancillary sectors that are also affiliated with that. And so that's what you have seen with the hex chrome rules. I think the challenge that we have when it comes to some of these toxics is you may have an individual facility uh, may or may not have fully sufficient controls uh, given their level of understanding. And that's where we put a lot of time and effort and where the review process uh, really comes into play. Santa Susana, as you know, is very unique because of the, the radioactive nature of the materials. And that was an instance where, you know, we as a air district don't have the radiation expertise and we rely on EPA and others to really lead those investigations and, and work very closely on those matters. So we hear you loud and clear. And um, the point that you raised though, I think is a really good one, which is let us identify all those sectors that we are looking at and look for the commonality and sort of report back to you on sort of where we see those and just to give you confidence that we're actually addressing those. So we'll, we'll look at that and get back to you and the board on that. Yeah, I think that would be very good. Um... And, and much appreciated. I remember um, with the issue of the uh, city of Paramount, we really had a kind of an incomplete understanding about what was going on at first. Yes. About the uh, different kinds of metal work uh, going on there and the fact that people were starting to complain about various things happening in their neighborhood, yep. uh, which caused us to then look at something that was happening about it migrating to the roof um, in ways that even the people conducting the businesses didn't quite understand. So I think we were extremely helpful there. I'm uh, not saying we failed in any way, just yeah. saying that I think looking at these, uh, you know, using this health risk assessment to help us understand where there might be more serious issues, um, I think could be very helpful to our work as well. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and my apologies. My uh, my camera overheated a moment ago. That's where I didn't step away. I just got lost. But anyhow, <laughs> with that, um, we will go ahead and go into our uh, our public comment on this item. Um, I will remind everyone we do have a, a three minute total public comment time for each commenter per uh, for the all the items on the agenda. And Harvey, we've be gone past that, but I'll go ahead and give you thirty seconds on this item. And uh, hopefully in the future we can keep that timer a little more automated. But Harvey, you have 30 seconds on this item because you have spoken for, we, we've already closer to six minutes. Okay, it's a Harvey at our PSPC. Under protest, there are other meetings of this board, et cetera, that they give three minutes on each and that should be utilized throughout, all right? As well as at the board, okay. Um, Benzene, we brought this up at six, 17 other meetings. They say in the new mates that one out of five, one out of four uh, uh, deaths uh, is from benzene. Okay, I want to know the numbers per million. What numbers are you using per million? And also PM, uh, what numbers are you using? Thank you, Mr. Edder, and thank you for your comments on the, uh, the timing issue. Um, it reminds me of an ad meeting to ask Wayne that we send a memo to all of our chairs of all of our various boards so we have a little more consistency for everybody. So our next uh, speaker just coming in is auto login. So auto login, we're not sure who your name is, but go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes on this item, unless you've already spoken earlier. That appears it may be me. My name's Duncan McKee. I wanted to uh, comment on this AB 2588. Uh, AQMD held a public meeting notifying residents of the excess of their risk due to the excess arsenic emissions being emitted by the Quameco facility. And they were ordered to do a risk reduction plan. 
and it doesn't look like they actually were required to reduce the risk of arsenic from what we could tell. We didn't get any further communication from AQMD, which is a little bit disturbing because I think the residents that are being poisoned actually have the right to know what's being done to reduce or eliminate that. And my understanding is some of the air quality scientists is AQMD indicated that there was an executive level decision made to require Quimetco to merely install this multi-metal SIMS and monitor their arsenic emissions rather than actually install additional emission control equipment that would reduce those emissions. And with this increase in throughput coming up, they almost certainly, from what I can see, would be adding more arsenic in to their process. And so theoretically, at least from our perspective, it'd be nice to open up some lines of communication between the community and AQMD scientists so we could better understand this. It appears there would be additional arsenic emissions. So, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody's prepared to answer any questions, but it'd be nice if, uh, if we could basically be informed on what's going to be done to reduce the arsenic emissions and how we're not going to have increased arsenic emissions. And the other thing is it appears this multi-metal SIMS is only measuring particulate arsenic and not the gaseous forms of arsenic, such as arsenine and arsenate that are regularly being emitted from this facility. So, you know, we're asking for a little better communication on this. And we're also asking, since that's the leading risk driver in the human health risk assessment from that facility, that AQMD do something to require this facility to reduce their arsenic emissions. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Camarera? Can you hear me? Okay. Can go ahead. My name is Marilyn Kamimura. I'm from Clean Air Coalition of North Whittier and Avocado Heights. I have lived in the areas of Avocado Heights, North Whittier, Bassett and La Puente for 49 years. So obviously I've gone through all the, I've worked with air quality management districts in a few projects. And I know through this time, for example, Athens, the Puente landfill, the intermodal facility, you know, and, uh, there was, that is now stopped. That we have lived with all of this for 40 some years. And to give us Comeco, I am well aware of the arsenic violations that have continued even with the health risk assessment and the risk reduction plan. So I'm quite disappointed that no matter what, we will be poisoned. There is no way that they can have that 25% increase because if they cannot handle it now, they certainly cannot handle it later. And unfortunately, we're the people that once you implement anything, I have learned through your inspectors and whatnot, that guess what, over a long term, there are errors that occur. There are downtimes. There are people we're requiring to count on. And we know we can't count on them. We have to only count on ourselves. And guess what? The people will just suffer. And they, because I know too many people that have died from cancer in this area. And because I, we've worked with USC and we've done soil testing, we know it's here. And we've done the door to door you know, so that we, that's why we approach the public health department, the 400 homes that we talk to people. So we know it's here and we just want no expansion for Comeco. And I am just saddened, very, very saddened that this crime is occurring to, to our community. It's as if we are second-class citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public commenters on this item? Right, thank you very much, everyone. With that, we'll go on to our written reports. Does any of our board members have any questions on the written reports that are attached? Not seeing anybody pop up. Uh, any of our board members have any other business they wish to discuss? 
related to stationary source. Not seeing any. We're going to go ahead in the general public comment period. I'm going to go ahead and reduce the general public comment to one minute each because we do have tech, uh, tech uh, committee meeting uh, at noon and our staff needs to get set up for that. We don't want to have any general public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Do you see auto login again? Go ahead. Okay, this is Duncan McKee again, and I'm commenting to since you've cut us down to one minute, it really eliminates a lot of the comments I would like to make. Uh, again, we'd like you to open up a line of communication with the community so that we could discuss some of the technical aspects <clears throat> in this increase in throughput that Quimeco has applied for. The other day, my brother, who is suffering from cancer that he believes was caused by Quimeco, right now he's hooked up to a chemotherapy pump with an IV coming out of his chest. When he tried to comment at the public hearing, you guys took his hand down. So that's a violation of ADA and access by people who need special accommodations. And I'm going to make a formal protest since you've cut me down to one minute right now. And the rest of it, I'm going to put in writing to you. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear you about your brother. And I'm not sure why his hand would have been put down at any time during a meeting. But um, I'm sorry I couldn't be here today as well. Uh, I do want to hear from him and, and from all the public. But we a lot of public items to go through today. And I, but I'm sorry that we do need to cut it short today for as far as one minute for general public comment. I will point out also that uh, both you and your, your uh, colleague were able to comment on the other item as well. So, uh, Mr. Harvey Etter, you have one minute on items not on the agenda. Hello, I'm assuming I'm being heard. I'm Harvey Etter. I'm speaking for myself and for Public Solar Power Coalition. Ditto, Duncan. Way to go. Join the club. I've, I've got kin. Uh, <laughs> Three grandkids of my first cousins under nine that live in Hacienda Heights are exposed to all this. Okay. At, at the last board meeting, they said that Wayne was consultant to Cometco and that Joe, why not's taken over? I want to know exactly what he, what he made, when they were, this was from, and how he was involved in the decision before the hearing board and this entity, and what's going to be done about it. I want a response now. I'm waiting. It's my time. Answer, please. Chair Benoit, I'm to respond if you would care to have me do that. Otherwise, I can talk with Mr. Edder separately. Why don't you go ahead? I think the public is concerned okay. about this. Okay. I just want to let everyone know that the reason that I'm handling this for Wayne is that although he has no legal prohibition for engaging in this matter with Cometco, he's been at South Coast AQMD for five years now. He chooses to recuse himself on all matters related to the facility uh, for the entire time he works for our agency. And that's just to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest. So uh, our executive officer has not been involved in anything related to Cometco uh, or other facilities that he was uh, involved with before he came to work for our agency. Uh, I'm, I'm confused. What, what dates was he a consultant to before he worked and while he worked with the agency? He's not been a consultant while he's worked with the agency, Harvey. This is what well, was before he was hired as our uh, executive director. So uh, since then, that activity has stopped. And uh, he just as an abundance of caution, even though that the actual, he probably could have started getting involved in this item, he's decided not to. That's what he's going to continue to do. All right, any, uh, any other public comments on items not on the agenda? Very good, and with that, staff, you've got three minutes to be ready for tech, tech committee. So thank you very much, and everyone have a, a great day, and uh, hopefully we can keep moving forward. Thank you.